I am so um, grateful that everyone's here. Maureen is back. Patty's here. And we thank you for all those who will be watching on Facebook and also um, on YouTube. We are covering today 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I um, want to start with a, a word of prayer. Dear Father, God, you are so gracious and kind to us. Thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that um, you would give us all enlightenment and spiritual understanding and knowledge of your Word, and that you would um, help us to know how to live to a life pleasing to you and that glorifies you. And um, we thank you for the King James Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Okay, so today um, we're going to be covering uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So um, it's about Christian order. Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Okay, and the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper and the Lord's Table are the same thing. So in um, chapter 11, verses 2 through 16... Order in the local church at Corinth. And then it breaks down to verses 17 through 34, our disorder at the Lord's table rebuked. So um, some of the questions uh, that someone might have when trying to figure out 1 Corinthians 11 is, what is the woman's covering? What does Paul mean by unworthily? When he says, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's in verse 27. What does Paul mean by damnation in verse 29? And does God chasten us in the dispensation of grace? That's verse 32. And how can I live a life pleasing to God now? So the divine order is something that Paul will go over today. And he will say that Father God, then comes Christ, then comes man, which is really the husband, and then comes the woman, the wife. So this is a chain of command among equals because we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is equal to the Father. And so um, that is a, a chain of command among equals. And now I want to just give you your homework for next week. So I want you to finish pages 185 to 188 in Lori Verstegen's book, Through the Book of Books. 185 to 188 and also to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. So we're using uh, Lori Verstegen's book, which is available on Amazon, for our handouts and as a workbook. And I also want to remind you that uh, my book, God's Secret, is available on Amazon. And it's a primer for people to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth and um, to make sure that they have a, a solid foundation in basic right division and that also covers the um, Bible in 100 pages. So that's available on Amazon. And um, I was so blessed to hear from a lady in the United Kingdom that um, she had been a Christian for 54 years and had been praying to God that um, the Lord would show her what the mystery is in the Bible. And somehow she came across God's secret and God answered her prayer. Mm -hmm. So now she's, you know, understanding the Bible. It's not just a bunch of um, contradictions to her. She's not having to, you know, be a blind guide to the blind. Mm -hmm. She now has, you know, been her mind and her understanding open to what the Bible says like she's never had before. And this was after 54 years of being Christian. And I was just so delighted to hear that. Then we have um, 
Romans, a concise commentary, um, which I was so blessed that somebody bought 30 copies of this book mm. this month, mm -hmm. apparently for one of their Bible studies. So that, that translates to about $600 worth of, of books, which that was really encouraging to hear. So um, let's now um, do our one sentence review of last week's study. So last week we covered um, chapter 10 and um, we, learn, uh, we are to learn from Israel's mistakes. Flee from idolatry. You cannot be partakers of both the Lord's table and the table of devils. So that was last week's um, lesson. It's available on Facebook, on God's Secret Facebook page, and also on YouTube. So before we start, let's um, take a quick look at our timeline. So um, can you follow me with the camera? Sure. Okay, so we have in the beginning Adam, Noah, and the Tower of Babel. So the Tower of Babel is where God put aside the Gentiles. And then he chose one man, Abraham, and made him um, of him a one nation called Israel. And he gave him the um, token and the covenant of circumcision. And so now we have the circumcised being having favored nation status and the Gentiles being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So then we had um, the promise of the Redeemer that was promised to Adam and Eve uh, going through the line of um, Israel see, through Moses, David. Well, Moses gave the law. Moses gave the law. So it was, it was the tribe of Judah. Um, Moses was a Levite. So it was from the tribe of Judah that Jesus came. So um, David was also from the tribe of Judah, and to him was promised a king to sit on the throne in the kingdom, uh, uh, one of his descendants. Then we had the, uh, the 400 years of silence. Mm -hmm. Then um, that was broken by John the Baptist, who pointed out Jesus to the nation of Israel. And then um, he came to his own, and he chose 12 apostles, but his own received him not. And he was crucified on the cross by the, his own nation and the you know, Romans. So he, um, he died on the cross for their sins. He was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And then he uh, was here for 40 days, and he ascended up into heaven. And um, he was um, supposed to... I should close this. He, he, he um, sent the Holy Ghost on the 120 in the upper room. Mm -hmm. And they got one more opportunity to share um, the kingdom um, message, you know, the, the good news that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And that they would, um, the gospel of the kingdom said that Jesus was their Messiah, the king of the Jews. So if they would believe that, then um, Jesus would return. Mm -hmm. But um, so for one year, they had an extension of mercy to Israel to through the little flock, the believing remnant. But when they stoned Stephen, they committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And Stephen saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing ready to pour out the final course of the five um, courses of punishment, the last week of Daniel's, the seven years of tribulation. But um, the Lord Jesus Christ surprised everybody, mm -hmm. and he put Israel's program on hold and saved his worst enemy, Saul of Tarsus, 
on the road to Damascus mm -hmm. and made him a minister to the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So here we have the body of Christ, and he inserted the dispensation of grace in which we live today. And, um, you know, he gave, made Paul the apostle of the Gentiles. So the body of Christ began here in Acts 9, and it's very important to know when the body of Christ began, because then we'll know, you know, how to rightly divide the word of truth, and what books are to us. To us is Romans to Philemon. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting because to Paul it was given um, to complete the word of God, or to finish the word of God. So the last book of the Bible written was 2 Timothy. But instead of putting 2 Timothy at the end after Revelation, God inserted it in the middle so that we will know that after the rapture of the church, mm -hmm. um, then he's still going to start his program, with resume his program with Israel. And the books Hebrews through Revelation is to help Israel to navigate through the tribulation period so that they can get into the kingdom at Christ's second coming. The, the ones that are alive will walk into the kingdom, and the ones that have died believing what God has said will be resurrected at his second coming and live with Christ for a thousand years. And then after that thousand years is up, God will um, release Satan, and he will pull away one quarter of the Gentiles in rebellion. Christ will um, put down that rebellion with fire. Yay. And then, yeah, <laughs> yay. And then there, uh, Christ will have the great white throne judgment of the lost. So those people who never believed what God said will be judged at that time, and they will th be thrown into hell, and hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. So um, I'm going to go right into our study now in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, I'm going to need my glasses. <laughs> Maybe my water, too. It's sort of a, a dry Santa Ana wind today. Okay, so please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So Paul has concluded answering the questions about eating meat offered to idols, which went from 8.1 to 11.1. So um, Paul now wants to restore order and unity around the Lord's table in the church. Apparently at Corinth, some of the women at the church at Corinth were saying, since all things are lawful for me, therefore I won't cover my head with a veil. Paul was disgusted also with the Corinthians' abuse of the Lord's Supper. So 1 Corinthians is such an amazing book to study because uh, the Corinthians were saved. So they were justified. But what was their problem, Patty? Oh, gosh. I'm okay. Blank. Oh, oh, the, oh. the word I'm looking for. Oh, my gosh. They were not. They were having problems oh. with their... Sanctification. Good. That's sanctification. Right. Oh, oh. That's right. They, oh. they, they needed to grow. Uh -huh. And uh, they needed to um, know how to live their life pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. And just like they need to know that, we need to know that. Mm -hmm. So this is so great because this is this is what we really need to know too. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in um, let's get into um, chapter 11, verse 1. Oh. Maureen, could you please read that verse? Verse 1, 11, 1. Be ye followers of me. Even as I also am of Christ. Okay. So limit your liberty for the sake of another as Christ and I have done. To follow Paul is to follow Christ's heavenly ministry. Because the body of Christ are an entity that will live in heaven. Because 
God has two realms, heaven and earth, and we're going to, you know, live in heaven, and the kingdom on earth people are going to live on earth. So Christ made Paul his minister um, to the body of Christ in Acts 26.16. Let's look there. I think the light is better, Patty, okay. if you can handle it. Uh, Acts 26, verse 16. Let's go there real quick. We're just looking at the fact that, you know, Christ made Paul his minister. Um, who's, who, um, you got it, Patty? Uh -huh. Go ahead. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Okay, so at this point on the road to Damascus, uh, Paul is rehearsing this to Agrippa and says, you know, that he made him a minister, um, that Jesus said, I'll, I'm, you're going to be my minister, mm -hmm. and that he's going to appear to Paul mm -hmm. with future revelation. Mm -hmm. Now, um, let's go to Romans 11.13. Um, Maureen, can you read that? Sure. And um, Patty, you're mm -hmm. going to read 15, Romans 15.16. So, okay. you can look at that. 11.13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Okay, so here is where it says that Paul is magnifying his office because he is, um, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, is what he says. Now let's turn to Romans fifteen sixteen. Patty, go ahead and read that. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles of ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Okay, so here it says that Paul is the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles, which is even fallen Israel mm -hmm. at this point, um, mm -hmm. they are considered uncircumcised and just like all other people. So... Um, to the Gentiles, all, which is all people on the earth, God is given an opportunity to believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, so that they might be saved and become members of the body of Christ, so they will have eternal life in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. So... Um, Paul wants to make sure that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So he, um, once Paul saves the, Gen the Gentiles in this dispensation of grace, he wants them to grow. So the offering up of them will be acceptable by the Holy Ghost. So we're not supposed to just, you know, relax. <laughs> and never open our Bibles. We're supposed to open our Bibles, and that's how we grow, uh, by reading the Word of God rightly divided and understanding it that way. So let's turn to Colossians 1.20, uh, I mean Ephesians 3.7, Maureen, and Colossians 1.25 for Patty. Ephesians 3.7, Maureen. We're still uh, talking about Paul being the minister. The minister. Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Okay, so Paul says that it's the power of God working in him to help him to do his work. And it, it really is the same for us. Um, it's, you know, Christ liveth in us, and the only thing that's going to last when we get to the judgment seat of Christ is what we've done with, you know, Christ working in and through us, um, and what we've done according to God's will. Now, we need to know, we know what God's will is now. What, what's God's will? He said, all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Yes, so that's 1 Timothy 2, 4. For all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
And so, you know, in the case of my friend in the UK, it was 54 years bet between her coming to the knowledge of truth, I mean, being saved and coming to the knowledge of truth. You know, and in my own case, it was 25 years. So it varies how many years it is before we learn um, the knowledge of the truth, which is our Bible's rightly divided. Um, and we know what, what is for the body of Christ, what, you know, and what's for Israel. Without that, the Bible is just, um, you know, a bunch of contradictions, and we end up being the, you know, blind guides leading the blind. And mixed up. Very mixed up, because we, we tend to mix what belongs to Israel and what Peter said with the things that Paul said when Peter was ministering to Israel and Paul to the body of Christ. So, Patty, can you read that verse in mm -hmm. Colossians 1.25? Mm -hmm. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Okay, so there it is. Paul's a minister, and it was given to him to fulfill the word of God or to finish it. So the final capstone of the Bible is Paul's revelation that it was given to him through Jesus Christ, who actually appeared to him one year after his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So let's go on now in, uh, to verse 2 in 1 Corinthians 11. Go back to 1 Corinthians 11, and let's get into our study. Um, Patty, do you want to read that? Sure. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Okay, so Paul had given some ordinances to the church at Corinth. And so ordinances are, um, you know, certain things to observe. Um, verse, um, okay. So Paul encourages the Corinthians to follow the instruction he has given them and they should keep the ordinances as he delivered them, you know, um, mm -hmm. keep exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. Paul then begins to talk about the order in the church. Some women were praying in tongues too much, mm -hmm. and some men were competing with others for a chance to speak. Everyone wanted the limelight. Okay, um, Maureen, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every woman is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, so that was the divine order. The Father, you know, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the man, the woman, mm -hmm. of, um, you know, among equals. So let's um, turn now and look at this chain of command among e equals a little bit further in Ephesians 5.23. Turn to Ephesians 5.23, and I'm going to read this verse. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife. So, that's important to know, that not every man is the head of every woman. Mm -hmm. It is the husband that is the head of the wife. Um, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So Christ is the head of the church, so he's the head of all of us believers in the body of Christ. Um, so this chain of command is very important because it's authority for the sake of order to eliminate confusion. There were too many chiefs in Corinth and not enough Indians. Mm -hmm. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 4.11 that we should study to be quiet. The head gives direction and the final say. Be sure to respect the head. Every man is not the head of the woman. Paul will make it clear that the husband is the head of the wife. For the sake of order in marriage, the wife should allow her husband to make the final decision. 
A wife is to respect her husband, as it says in Ephesians 5.33. In turn, uh, the husband must be willing to die for her, as it says in Ephesians 5.25. Christ said, I and the Father are one in John 10.30. However, he also said, My Father is greater than I in John 14.28. So he's acknowledging the Father's headship over him. Christ voluntarily took a lower place while he was on earth. And we know about that in Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Let's take a look at that. Philippians 2, 5 through 7. I'll read that. this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So he was equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He, he fulfilled the Father's plan. Um, so, as a woman submits to her husband, she practices submitting to her master, the Lord Jesus Christ. She gives him all the glory, for he alone, the Lord Jesus Christ, is worthy, and we will praise his name forever. Paul now will apply the headship principle to wearing the customary veil in Corinth. And so, uh, Maureen, can you read uh, verse 4 and 5? Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. Okay, and, uh, that's good. So her, the woman's head, uh, we said, was her what? Girls, ladies. Uh -oh. Her, the woman's head is—is is it every single man on the planet, or is it just her oh, husband? Her husband. Oh, her husband, husband. right? Well, what okay. If you don't have a husband. Uh, well, <laughs> then you know it—it it could be your brother. Or your father, you know. So, praying is talking to God, while prophesying is speaking to the church of God, for God. So, praying is talking to God, and then prophesying is speaking to the church for God. Prophecy, or prophesying, also involves determining which letters are scriptures and what the divine order um, of those letters should be in the canon of scripture. And so that's already been determined. Uh, uh, those um, copyists that worked with Paul in, um, uh, in the early church were copying all 66 letters of the Bible. There should be nothing between a man and his head. So he shouldn't wear anything on top of his head uh, because his head is Lord Jesus Christ and he should be open to the Lord. He, because he's, um, the man is made in his image, he's redeemed by the Lord, and he is his authority. Uh, Patty, can you read verse 6, please? Mm -hmm. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Okay, so the covering there is the veil. Okay, so um, he's saying that if a woman is not, doesn't wear her veil, she might as well uh, be shorn. Shorn is to have a haircut. Or shaven, which is, you know, to be bald. 
So although it's not customary in our country to wear veils, in some countries veils and shawls are considered modest apparel for women to show respect to their husbands. For both men and women ambassadors for Christ, what we wear and how we conduct ourselves should honor our ultimate head, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not to be conformed to this world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's Romans 12, 2. Paul says that the woman should be modest and cover her head with a veil to distinguish himself from the prostitutes out of respect for her husband and the culture in Corinth. Many of the priestesses at the temple of Aphrodite were essentially prostitutes. They had shaven bald heads or short hair, shorn, and did not wear veils like the fine ladies. And I think that even the veil of, of a bride mm -hmm. comes from some of these traditions, mm -hmm. the traditions in Israel and some of the traditions of the, of the veil at Corinth. Um, so a lot of, you know, brides do wear a veil when they get married. Okay. Um, Maureen, could you read verse 7? For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Okay. Sometimes I remind my husband, I'm your glory. <laughs> you know. Um, so Moses covered his face with a veil so that the people of Israel would not discover that the glow of his face that he re had received when he spoke with God was fading away. And we see that in Exodus 34, 33 through 35, and 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But when Moses spoke with God, his head was uncovered. Paul says men should not cover their heads. There should, be nothing, should not be anything between them and their Savior. So... Let's um, turn now to Exodus 34, 33 through 35. Patty, mm -hmm. I'll let you go there. Mm -hmm. And then um, you, Maureen, can do 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But you can look with us in, mm -hmm. in Exodus 2. Um, okay. 33, 34, 33. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. Great. Awesome. Okay, Maureen, um, mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Okay, so um, the, see how it's, it, the glory uh, of his countenance was done away hmm. of Moses. So it's interesting mm -hmm. that, you know, he and Moses also wore a veil. Um, let's go on now um, to verse 8, Patty, Ele uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Keep going. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Okay, so the woman was made um, um, to be Adam's help me. Both were made in God's image. Um, <laughs> the wind is really kicking up. So let's turn um, to see this. Raise the roof. Oh, oh my God. goodness. Genesis 2, 18 and 22. 
Let's go to Genesis 2, 18 and 22. Okay, 2, 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And 22 says, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Okay, um, both were made in God's image. Patty, can you read Genesis 127? Mm -hmm. And Maureen, can you read Genesis 5 1? So God created a man in his own image. In no, the, no, no, there's no A there. Oh, okay, so okay, try it again. Go okay. ahead. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay, so... Where was that? That's in 127, that oh. both male and female were created in God's image. Oh. And now we're going to read Genesis 5, 1. Oh. Go ahead, Maureen. Okay. Genesis this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Okay, and one more verse. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. Okay, so this is, we are part of Adam's family. <laughs> we got to snap our fingers. Okay, that was an old, car, um, old television show, and um, it was really good. Uh, but um, we are part of Adam's family and, and until we're translated into the Lord Jesus Christ. So the woman was made to complete the man to make his life richer, fuller, and more exciting. Oh. That's right, we do. They would be so bored without us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be his helpmate, meet his companion, the other part of him. No man is complete without a woman except in special cases, when God has given special grace to a man for a special work. Paul said this in... 1 Corinthians 7, 7, and we went over that. He's, you know, he, he said, you know, I wish that everyone was like me that could be, remain single. And the Lord said so in Matthew 19, 12, when he said, you know, some people are born eunuchs, and some people are made eunuchs, and some people choose to be eunuchs. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, because they want to live a life of singlehood, for special service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so apparently, you know, like I said before, some of the women in the church at Corinth were saying, since all things are lawful for me, therefore I won't cover my head with a veil. Mm -hmm. So what does Paul say in response? He says, since the veil is a sign of submission to the husband and to God, in the culture at Corinth, the women in that church should wear the veil. But God does not apply that custom to all the churches, as we will see when we get to verse 16. Mm. However, Paul does say elsewhere that women should dress modestly. Mm. Let's turn to 1 Timothy 2, 8 and 10. 8 through 10. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. Keep your hand in 1 Corinthians 11 as you go over to 1 Timothy. Two, um, two, eight through ten. Patty, you want to tackle those? Sure. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with bra braided, braided hair mm -hmm. or gold or pearls or costly array, but which cometh becometh women professing godliness with good works. Mm -hmm. So shamefacedness is, you know, with modesty. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So they're, they're supposed to behave modestly and dress modestly. And when it says lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, you know, it's not hands of fists fighting against God, mm. but it's, it's hands of, you know, acceptance and receiving the things of God. Um, so that's what that means. Mm. Peter also wants women to dress modestly. Um, Maureen, could you read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1, 3, and 4? So this is uh, Peter in Israel's program. Also wants um, his people to dress modestly. 1 Peter 3, 1, 3, and 4. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that in any... If, if any. Oh, okay, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. And then three and four. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. Okay. Actually, we shouldn't have left out verse 2. Go ahead and read verse 2 also. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, Mm -hmm. And fear is reverence. So, um, you know, in the conversation there being um, behavior or, or manner of life. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, okay, said, um, also says that the husband should treat the woman as the weaker vessel. So when it says the weaker vessel there, mm -hmm. I think of it as, you know, fine porcelain, China. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> I That's heard pretty it, strong. Too. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it, it should mm. be. Um, so let's look at First Peter three seven. Go ahead, uh, Maureen. Read that verse two and three seven. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. That oh, your that's prayers. It. That's yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead. That your prayers be not hindered. Oh, okay. no, yeah. I I had a line under that, so I didn't see that. Yeah. So no one wants to have their prayers hindered. Mm -hmm. um, um, but um, so we and the husband is supposed to honor his wife is and cherish her. Is what Peter is saying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and when he says weaker vessel, mm -hmm. um, we know uh, as a mother of three, myself, and a retired nurse midwife, I'm able to say that mothers have to be tough because of childbearing. Um, it's very painful, difficult work, which requires great strength and stamina. And just being a mom <laughs> is yes. a lot of work, you know, loads of laundry, lots mm -hmm. of housework. So, women should dress modestly, yet be appealing. We can fix our hair and wear a little makeup occasionally. Patty, can you read verse 10, please? For this cause... No, wait, wait. <laughs> I'll read it. For this cause... Uh, and we're eating carrot cake. <laughs> Patty said to Sorry. <laughs> we're all eating carrot cake. For this cause ought the women to have power, which is authority on her head because of the angels. So here Paul inserts this as another reason why um, you know uh, we should have uh, power over our head because of the angels are watching us. How do you know that's uh, what he's referring to there? Well even if it is wearing the veil you know, it, um, or if it's, you know, it, it, the point is that we are to treat our husband with all, you know, submission and subjection and reverence mm -hmm. and respect. So if we're not doing that, 
You know, if we're not being careful how we say things and what we say, mm -hmm. then, the, you know, that's uh, displeasing to the Lord, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's bad example to the angels. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, no. we want to be a good, they're yeah. already thinking, you know, why is God using, you know, these dirt bags, people, <laughs> people who have all of this, these oh. imperfections mm -hmm. and are imperfect, mm -hmm. you know, what, mm -hmm. why is he even using mm -hmm. and, and them? Mm -hmm. And, and so we don't mm -hmm. want to let our Lord down. We want him to think that it was a good idea. <laughs> to use us because it's a privilege to be used by him. Power on her head. Mm -hmm. So the power um, to, uh, uh, on her head because of the angels. Mm -hmm. So the power on her head there is probably wearing, wearing the veil. Okay. Verse 11, Patty. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. One more. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Okay, so we saw that the woman was made from Adam's rib in Genesis 2.22, but the woman also gives birth to the man. So the man needs the woman, and the woman needs the man. We both have strengths that we can bring to the marriage. We are one flesh, one team. This is what our Lord said about marriage. Let's turn to Matthew 19, 4 through 6. Will you please read that, um, Maureen? Matthew 19, 4 through 6. This is what the Lord Jesus said about marriage and that's in the marriage vows. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And so it's nice to know where those marriage vows verses are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Patty, can you read 13, please? Okay. 1 Corinthians eleven thirteen. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Okay, so... Uh, they're supposed to be able to discern or make a decision if it's comely or, or beautiful for a woman to pray unto God uncovered. Or should she, you know, submit to the culture that she's living in, which would be respectful to her husband, right? Mm -hmm. um, Maureen, verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that... If a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Okay. Yeah, what, what about oh, that? Okay. All right. So, most male animals have short hair, with a few exceptions, such as like the lion. Mm. Men should not look like women, and vice versa. We shouldn't have to wonder. I wonder if that's a man or a woman, you know? In Bible times, the Nazarite vow was an act of consecrating oneself to God. It was symbolized by long, uncut hair. Right. Yeah. This meant that the Nazarite was willing to bear the shame for God's name. Oh. Even at that time, long hair on men was considered shameful. Mm. So, when they make pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. sometimes they might have not realize that he's not a Nazarite, he's a Nazarene. Oh, and so he probably had short hair um, in real life. Oh. Was it Samson that was a Nazarene? Yes, it was. Yeah. Sam Samson was. Oh, because he never cut his he hair. He never cut his hair. 
Yeah. But b because they, they can bear sh the shame? Yeah, it's a, sh it's a shame for a man to wear long hair. Uh -huh. Patty, can you please... Um, uh, who read that last time? Was that Patty? Did you read that? Mm, I think you did. <laughs> oh, I, no, the shame on too oh. long. Oh, oh, okay. I'm okay, go ahead hair. and read 15, Maureen. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay, so Paul changes course a little here because he doesn't want to impose veil wearing on all the churches. Mm -hmm. He now says that the woman's hair is her covering. Uh -huh. our Long hair is a glory to her. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. what he says. Okay. It, her long hair, it is a glory to her. But we are free to wear our hair in the dispensation of grace um, any way that is becoming because it is what Christ did for us that is important mm -hmm. not our hair length yeah. for a while mm -hmm. I had short hair because mm -hmm. my hair was breaking um, I found out that the cause for the breaking of my hair was that I was on a high protein diet so when you eat a lot of protein the protein breaks down into amino acids and the amino acids have to be buffered by something so your body robs your bone and your hair and your nails from it the calcium carbonate to mm -hmm. buffer or um, you know or balance out the amino acid so mm -hmm. I I you know I once I found out what was the cause of my weak bones and my breaking of my hair I start, started a different diet, okay? Um, I, I'm not low-carbohydrate anymore. Um, I am now a high-starch. I'm on a high-starch diet, which is low meat, and my hair and my nails and my bones all became stronger and longer. <laughs> so I'm just sharing that because, you know, we can't judge someone that has short hair because maybe they had to shave their hair because they had, you know, cancer, mm -hmm. or you know maybe they, you know, just have um, breakage of their hair like I did. So, um, so remember in the Bible the woman who dried Jesus's feet with her hair. Mm -hmm. She was in essence saying, you know, since a woman's hair is her glory that you are, I glorify you more than my hair. Oh. Okay. You're wor worthy of everything, Lord. Oh. You know, yeah. I, I wipe my, your feet with my hair. I glorify you above all else. And that's in John 12, 3. We're not going to go there for sake of time, but it is... Um, well, should we go there? Okay, let's go there. John 12, 3. John 12, 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, whoever gets to John 12, 3 can read it. Patty, yeah, are you there? I got it. Okay. Then Mary took... Then a, took Mary. Oh, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Okay, very good. Mm. Okay, there's actually two different women at two different times that, that oh. do that for the Lord, oh. you know, oh. but oh. Mary was one of them. Okay, okay verse 16, 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen. 16, um, Maureen? But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Okay, so um, some men may insist on having long hair, which is often a sign of rebellion. Paul concludes by saying that the church should not make any rules in connection with the matter of women's dress or men's hair. Paul says that he is not giving one rule for all other churches to follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to start our second section, 
which is about the Lord's Supper. So, Patty, can you please read verse 17? Okay. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Okay, so Paul now rebukes the Corinthians for their abuse of the, um, of the Lord's table. Paul says that the Corinthians were coming together for the worse, not for the better. They had a meal that preceded the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, which is the same as the Lord's table. And this is also the same way the Lord Jesus Christ did it. First they ate on that night, and then they, he instituted the Lord's Supper. Paul only mentions the celebration of the Lord's Supper in this epistle. But how often does God have to tell us something before we obey? I hope you will say, once. Still, we are under grace, not uh, the law, and different churches celebrate the Lord's death for us in different ways. It's something that we we um, you know think about every day, every second of every day. So, in this epistle, we are commanded to remember the day of Jesus Christ's death. Not the day of his birth. Mm -hmm. We, of course, can individually remember the Lord's death every waking moment, but this is a local church group activity that um, he's talking about. It is something the body of Christ should do together with gratitude because his death for our sins at Calvary is what we all have in common. That's the one thing that binds us. Mm -hmm. So we celebrate it because Christ accomplished our redemption. He was victorious in paying the costly price for our penalty after living a perfect life and dying a perfect death. It was his merit, love, and courage. Some churches celebrate it monthly and some quarterly. Some just share a meal and others just the bread and the grape juice. Mm -hmm. Since the event took place during the week of unleavened bread, the juice was unfermented. It is called the fruit of the vine, never wine in the Gospels. Paul is concerned about order and unity. They should have come together out of love for each other, not for the worse <laughs> in, in Corinth, right? So, uh, verse 18, Maureen, 18 and 19. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Okay, so... Um, Paul said that they were eating in cliques, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. That's divisions here. Mm -hmm. Dividing themselves from one another. He had most likely heard this from Chloe's house, this information, and he said that those who do so commit heresies, while those who do not are approved. Heresies means unsound doctrine or opinions. Remember when Peter and Barnabas withdrew from the Gentiles when certain men from James came and Paul withstood Peter to his face? Mm -hmm. He did it because Peter knew that God was not making a difference between Jews and Gentiles in the dispensation of grace that had begun with Paul. So by separating himself, that's Peter, and eating with, only with Jews, Peter was denying that the middle world partition between the circumcision and uncircumcision was broken down. So let's look at those verses in Galatians 2, 11 through 21, and then 3, 28. Galatians 2, 11 through 21, and, and I'll read this. 
And then, Patty, you can read 328 when I finish that. Mm -hmm. Go eat popcorn. So right after 2 Corinthians is Galatians. Please turn with me to 2 because I want you to see these verses on your own. So here we go. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that dissimulation is hypocrisy, that they were walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, the gospel that's now in effect, the gospel of grace, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? For who are Jews, no, for we are Jews, you know, him and, and, and Peter, by nature, because they, they were born Jews, mm -hmm. and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, it, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is there for Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So if Peter is now doing a sin, by denying what God is doing right now in the dispensation of grace, does that make Christ a sinner? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So if Peter is now insisting that this middle wall of petition is pertains to this dispensation, he is building again what has been destroyed. Um, and he becomes a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul is saying, it's all about what Jesus has done. It's not about separation right now. It's, mm -hmm. you know... Uh, so, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness cometh, come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So, it's all about Christ's death, you know, what his great sacrifice. So, Patty, can you read 328? Mm -hmm. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, so in, in the body of Christ, there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, male or female. We're all one. Um, let's go on. Uh, verses 20 and 21. Maureen? When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper for one is hungry and another is drunken okay so he Paul is saying when you you come together you should be thinking that this is for the purpose of celebrating the Lord's Supper and having fellowship with others not feeding yourselves mm. people you know and not grabbing the, you know what food they want first the biggest piece of the pie or whatever People were bringing their own food and not sharing it with those who were poor and hungry. You know, they brought their own lunch. Some were even drunk. They were in no condition to remember Christ or what he had done for them. 
Some of them might even have thrown up a little bit. A little vomiting might have been going on <laughs> by these drunks, okay? Don't <laughs> Patty, 22. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Okay, so see, Paul says, I praise you not. He's got steam coming out of his ears. He's angry, okay? Yeah. He says, what? Paul is appalled. If they were not going to share in time of fellowship, they should have eaten at home. The fellowship was broken by their behavior. And so he says, um, don't you have homes where you can eat before you come? Do you despise other believers and shame those who don't have as much money as you to buy nice food? Paul is furious and he asks, Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Mm -hmm. yep. Breaking bread together means sharing, not every person having their own. Okay, verses 23. Verse 23, um, Maureen. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Okay, so uh, Paul says that he delivered. See, see there? Make sure you underline delivered. I delivered unto you. Okay? So, um... To them, what the Lord Jesus personally told him. The same night that he was betrayed by Judas, at the end of the meal, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to the twelve. Notice that Judas took part in this remembrance ceremony. After Jesus had washed Judas's feet with the others. So that's in John 13, 10 through 12 and 27, and Luke 22, 19 through 22. Should we look at that? Yes. Okay. Patty, why don't you, you do John 13, 10 through 12 and 27? And then Maureen, why don't you do Luke 19 through 22? And what was that? Again? So John 13, John 13, 13, 10 through 12. 10 through 12. Go ahead. Okay. Isn't it incredible that he washed the feet of Judas mm -hmm. and, and let him share in that, you know, special ceremony? Um, go ahead, Patty. It's 13, 10 through 12. Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not to save, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit and ye are clean but not all for he knew who should betray him and therefore said he ye are not all clean so after he washed uh, their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again and and he said to unto them he said unto them Know ye what I have done to you? Okay, that's good. And now a verse uh, 27, Patty, in that same chapter. And after the saw Satan in, entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, that, that thou doest do quickly. Okay, so, um, you know, it's interesting how Satan entered into Judas at this point because Satan was thinking if I have a job to do I gotta do it myself so he entered into Judas and Judas went out after they had had this meal mm -hmm. um, the, um, the Lord's Supper go ahead um, read Luke 22 19 through 22 Maureen it's uh, verses 19 to 22 yeah, 22, 19 to 22. Oh, 22. And he took.
took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new Testament of my blood in my blood. New Testament oh, in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Okay, so uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is now giving Judas an opportunity to repent. Mm -hmm. Bef you know, before he, but he's, you know, he's pretty much give, made up his mind. But the Lord gave him another chance right there to uh, change his mind about what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. Patty, can you read 1124? Okay. <laughs> and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Okay, so Paul is sharing exactly what the Lord told him to the Corinthians once again. Mm -hmm. So the Lord had to drink the cup of God's wrath because of all mankind's sin. But So not only did he have to die that painful death, but all sins of all mankind were placed on him. Um, but for us, what the Lord did is a, the cup of blessing. So go with me to 10.16 in um, 1 Corinthians 10.16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So for us, what he did you know, is a cup of blessing because there was no other way that we could be saved than that he, you know, went through with what he did. Mm -hmm. Without his sacrifice, we have no hope. In giving instruction about the supper, Paul quotes the Lord, and we should remember how he offered his body in our place. So in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Mm -hmm. So um, this is when, you know, He became sin for us, that we might be able to have Christ's righteousness imputed to our account. Um, mm -hmm. Maureen, verse 25, 11-25. After the same manner also He took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Okay. So, now that the testator is dead, you know, since he has died almost 2,000 years ago, not quite, his will can be carried out. He was a perfectly satisfying sacrifice that the Father accepted on our behalf. So, now I'm going to uh, read the verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's Supper, I mean the Lord's death, till He come. <laughs> so, as we remember this together as a group we are showing forth the lord's death until he come and so he's this is till he comes to to catch us up at the you know in in the he comes appears in the air we're waiting for that appearance of our lord jesus christ to catch us up um to in the clouds so um that's what we're doing so so we're we're showing forth his death we're showing forth this is why the body of christ should celebrate this you know we're celebrating all that he accomplished through his death this so as often as we eat the bread and drink the juice 
We are celebrating his death until he comes in the air to catch us up. Um, Patty, verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Okay. So what does Paul mean here? You know, do, do we want to be unworthy? Do we want to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord? Let's come to an understanding. So he is really saying that no one should eat or drink the cup unworthily with drunken, gluttonous, unruly behavior. Okay? We should be doing it reverently. Reverently in gr gratitude. With gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. For what the Lord has done. Okay, uh, verse 28, Maureen. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So a man should examine his conduct and consider what Christ has done for him. And after that, he can drink the cup. Paul just wants them to do it in an orderly way. So he's not saying that you can't drink the cup. Any believer has the imputed righteousness of Christ and is worthy to drink the cup. But he doesn't want them to do it in an unruly, you know, rambunctious kind of way, but with, you know, respect and gratitude for what Christ has done. Because we couldn't have done it. We couldn't have done what he did. And because, for one thing, we're not perfect. <laughs> and we're, our blood is not perfect like his was. So, verse 29, Patty. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning. Okay, yeah, okay, wait, wait a second, wait a second. All right, um, not discerning, keep going. Not discerning the Lord's body. Okay, so what does Paul mean with damnation here? The damnation is not going to hell. That's not what he means. It is not come, a damnation that's coming from God, but they were reaping the fruit of their own sinful conduct. Uh -huh. Christ has already died for their sins. They are now, that they are now committing by being drunk in this, at, during the celebration of what he's done for them. Unworthily is an adverb. It refers to their behavior, not to them. They were drunk and gluttons at the Lord's Supper. It was unworthy, sinful be conduct during the remembrance ceremony for Christ's death for their sin. So when they were not discerning the Lord's body, the Corinthians had a problem with discernment because whoever eats the bread without reverence and gratitude does not understand the great sacrifice that the Lord Jesus has made on their behalf. That's, you know, trotting underfoot what he has done. Mm -hmm. So, um, verse 30, um, is it your turn, Maureen? Sure. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So, the Corinthians were weak, sickly, because of their lifestyle. Too much mm -hmm. booze. Too much uh -huh. booze, okay? Too much um, food. Uh, too much gluttony. So they needed to wake up to who they were in Christ and work, walk circumspectly. Turn with me to Ephesians 5, 14 through 16. Ephesians 5, 14 through 16. Okay, and, and I'll read these verses. Wherefore, he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Wake up, you know, in your behavior. I mean, are you ignoring the Bible? <laughs> That's the, you know, how we get faith. Faith cometh by hearing, right? See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So, um, the sleep there, is there a sleep to the to the Word of God and the things of God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Paul has to slap them a little bit 
on the face. Get them going here. Um, verse 31, Patty. Uh, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay. So if they would judge themselves, they would not need to be judged by someone else. We should judge our own conduct so that we do not have to be judged by others. Let's turn in this chapter to 2.15 and then Galatians 6.1. So, let's see what it says in 2.15. 1 Corinthians 2.15 says this, But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged by no man. And then in 5.5 in it says, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So Paul is kind of helping the Corinthians to learn discernment, to learn how to make decisions in their assembly. Uh, turn to Galatians 6.1. Okay. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, Ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So if someone is doing something like, you know, drinking to excess, and you have to say to them, you know, that's not appropriate, um, then, um, you know, be careful that you don't start drinking too much also. So, however, Christ has paid for our sins, and they had, he had paid for the Corinthian sins. We have the imputed righteousness of Christ, and we are complete in him. So, Christ has already died for the sin of drunkenness that they are committing. Let's turn to Romans um, 4.24. And 25. Patty, go ahead. Romans 4.24 and 25. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Okay, so we will have that imputed righteousness um, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. So um, that's, you know, basically the gospel. Um, uh, we did 2 Corinthians 5.21, but go, let's do it again. Maureen, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And then, Patty, you can do Colossians 2.10. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Mm. I love that verse because it's the substitutionary death of Christ. He didn't have any sin of his own, but he became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Colossians 2.10, Patty? Mm -hmm. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. Good. We were unworthy, but he paid for us with his own blood. He redeemed us and justified us. Now we are worthy because we have Christ's righteousness imputed to us. If it was, no, no, it was Christ's merit. It, you know, not our merit, right? It was his righteousness, not our righteousness. God is not punishing people in the dispensation of grace. This is a time of amnesty. This is a time of amnesty. God is dispensing grace right now. Um, so, um, he's, God is offering grace and peace. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1.3. Maureen, 1 Corinthians 1.3. Okay. Third verse in this chapter this is something that Paul always keeps saying in all his letters. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So God is offering grace and peace. See how it says mm -hmm. so right here? Grace mm -hmm. and peace. Yeah. That's what God offers. And Paul says this in, in every single of his 13th epistle. Romans to Philemon. He says mm -hmm. grace and peace. And sometimes he adds mm -hmm. mercy in his mm -hmm. uh, pastoral epistles to Timothy and, and Titus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, Let's turn now to 2 Corinthians 5.19. 2 Corinthians 5.19, and I'll read this one. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So he is, God is not imputing trespasses unto them during the dispensation of grace. Hmm. So um, he's offering grace and peace. So it's not um, our sins that, you know, makes us go to hell. It's unbelief in what Christ has done for us in the gospel, you know, believing you know, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's what we need to believe to be saved. So, um, the Lord used... Oh, wait, wait. Okay, so um, now, Patty, can mm -hmm. you read verse 32? Okay. 1 Corinthians 11, 32. Uh, but when we are judged... We are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay. So, um, so when we're chastened, that's corrected, mm -hmm. of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Paul says that the Lord finds a way to chasten us. Chasten means correct. Perhaps through other people... You know, someone that says, you know, you're not really supposed to be drunk at the church, you know. Mm -hmm. Or conviction of the Holy Spirit. In this case, God is using Paul's letter to chasten the Corinthians. So, this is how God is working in this day and age, okay, to chasten us. It's through other people. Mm -hmm. Okay? Remember, you know, you who are... Um, what would they say in Galatians six one? You you who are are something. What, what did it say exactly? Let's look at that one more time. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, uh -huh. ye which are spiritual, oh, restore spiritual. such, and one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Okay, so someone that's spiritual, you know, that means mature, uh -huh. um, in in Pauline doctrine can restore somebody else who, it, when they notice that, you know, they're behaving in error and they haven't judged themselves, they haven't said, you know, this is not a good thing that I'm doing, I shouldn't maybe, you know, not drink so much before I come to church, right? So, um, Paul reproved them, believers are able to admonish one another. Let's look in Romans 15.4 and 2 Corinthians 3.15. Romans 15.4, let's do that first. We're doing good on time. We're doing really good. We have a half an hour left and we might finish early. Romans 15.4. 15.14. Patty, are you there? Mm -hmm. Okay, go for it. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Okay, so admonish is, is kind of like, you know, correct when each other. Mm -hmm. So, so warn. Uh, warn. Ye, warn and correct. Say, you know, you know don't drink that much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Maureen, can you read 2 Corinthians 3.15? Second Thessalonians 3.15. I don't know what I said. Oh, I meant 2 Thessalonians 3.15. Remember, Thessalonians is also a um, 
a letter that Paul wrote during his Acts ministry. Oh. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay, so see, there's that word admonish again. So you're not going to, uh, you know, count someone that you need to correct as an enemy. You're going to admonish them as a brother or sister. Okay, gently and graciously and usually privately. <laughs> you know, so the Lord's instruction to chasten his people is, um, is mentioned in Psalm 94.12. So let's look at that. Psalm 94, 12. Okay. Psalm 94, verse 12. I got it. You got it, Betty? Uh-huh. Okay. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. Okay, so when we chasten someone or, um, you know, admonish someone... We should be doing it out of the law, which is not, you know, Israel's um, Bible, uh, you know, their, uh, their, their books, but out of our books, Romans through Philemon. So we go to the Word of God and say, you know, um, this is what it says here, you know, and this is why you shouldn't be doing what you are doing. At other times, we must suffer the consequences of our poor choices. So if someone drives drunk and has an accident, they lose the license, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's another way that we're chastened, you know, by our own consequences for our actions. Mm -hmm. Once a person is saved, they cannot lose their salvation. And this is drilled home in Romans 8, 32, and 39. And... Um, I'm going to just uh, go to, you know, this book here uh, and go to the end of chapter 8. Okay. And so, um, if you want to, you can go there. We're not going to read all those verses, but basically, in verse 31, 831, the power of God is for us. In uh, verse 32, the grace of God is for us. In verses 33 and 34, the justice of God is for us. And in verses 35 through 39, the love of God is for us. That's on page 60 in uh, Romans, a concise commentary. So, um, verse 33, Maureen. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. So Paul says that when they come together to commemorate God, Christ's death, that they should wait to eat until everyone has the bread and juice or food before they eat. You know, this is, you know, the way to do something together, you know, in unity and, um, and be polite about it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, Patty, verse 34. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Okay. So, their conduct is bringing condemnation on them. Mm -hmm. If they are too hungry to wait, then they should eat at home before... They act like drunk, selfish gluttons. That's condemnation. If you're acting like a drunk, selfish glutton, that's bringing condemnation on yourself. Mm -hmm. They were out of order in many ways. There are other things that Paul will set in order when he comes. Paul tells Timothy how to instruct those who oppose themselves in 2 Timothy 2... 24 through 26. Let's go there. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. Okay, I got it. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, 
So this is how we're going to correct them, okay? Those, how we're going to admonish. In meekness, instructing those who impose themselves, so they're doing something that's, that's really hurting themselves with their mm -hmm. own conduct, mm -hmm. okay? If God pure adventure would give them repentance, you know, help them change their mind, to the acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So, people who are in wrong doctrine, for example, someone that doesn't understand when the body of Christ began. It's so important to understand that the body of Christ began in Acts 9, so that you know what body of doctrine is to you, and, um, you know, what God, what, you know, how God, what's the gospel for today, and how we're supposed to act, and many other reasons why it's so important not to drag in what, you know, belongs to Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to read our own mail. Mm -hmm. So, um, we must mm -hmm. be gentle, as we just read, mm -hmm. patient, and apt to teach. Paul never questions the Corinthian salvation, only their conduct, which was often like they behaved before they were saved. The Corinthians were thought, uh, um, thought that all things were lawful for them. Okay, Paul says, tell them to be polite and gracious and to wait to eat. They should have some regard for others. The word of God should be used to help others. What the Corinth? What was the Corinthians' problems? Not Sanct yes. Sanctification. Sanctification, <laughs> right? They needed. They were living below their identity as Christians. They were guilty of conduct unbecoming of a saint. They were carnal and babes. Their conduct did not match their identity in Christ, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's Romans 8, 7. That's a carnal Christian there. Carnal believers are dead while they are living. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. That's 1 Timothy 5, 6. Grace teaches us that we should live how we should live. Okay? It teaching us that Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2.12 So, it's hard to beat sobriety and clear-headedness. I think it's in Ephesians 5.18 where it says, Do not be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Filled, something like that. I, I need to put that verse in here. Okay, so to conclude, I personally believe that the Lord's Supper should be practiced, perhaps at the end of a fellowship meal, because of what Christ has done. There are no believers who are unworthy of partaking of the Lord's Supper. Let's turn to Romans 3.24 and 5.1. So, um, Maureen, can you read Romans 3.24 and then... Mm -hmm. um, Patty, why don't you do five one Romans okay. five one? We're almost done, everybody. Romans three twenty four. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we were justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, um, salvation is a free gift. We can't add anything to what God has done. Mm -hmm. Not one molecule of what we ourselves have done can be added to that, or we spoil it. And, um, and uh, you know, we disannul what he's done, and we uh, insult God. So, Patty, 5-1. Romans 5-1. That as sin... No, therefore, oh, Romans 5-1. Therefore, oh, five, one. Oh, okay. I thought 21. Um, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
-huh. But as Paul said, we should do, you know, partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. So, uh, Pastor Brian Ross of Grace Life Bible Fellowship helped me with these last several verses. He, um, you know, I watch his um, YouTube studies because he spent for, um, two years going through 1 Corinthians. And he, he also shared some notes with me on these last few verses. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for him for helping me with those verses for this, in preparing for this lesson. Mm -hmm. And also Nathan Cody helped mm -hmm. me a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's nice that we in the body of Christ can help each other. Yeah. Um, were they, okay, so I have a couple of questions. Were the Corinthians sinning in their obser observance of the Lord's Supper? Were they sinning? Were they sin? Yes, they were. Yeah. Okay, they were sinning, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They were sinning. We got a yes on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. What does the Lord's Supper commemorate? Christ's death. Christ's death for our sins. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul had to rebuke the Corinthians because they had failed to judge this matter for themselves. That's why he kept kept saying, you know, you need discernment. Mm -hmm. You don't have any discernment. Mm -hmm. They weren't judging them themselves mm -hmm. for, you know, in their church. Mm -hmm. So let's close with a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for all the brothers and sisters that help each other, that want to have unity, mm -hmm. that want to... Um, you know, uh, be a team mm -hmm. and, and team players mm -hmm. since there's, you know, the ground is level at the foot of the cross and you've done everything for us. Um, let us remember every moment of every day mm -hmm. with gratitude all that you've done for us and give you all the glory for you alone are worthy and we will praise your name forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.